The Theory of Need in Marx by Agnes Heller. This is chapter two, the general philosophical concept of needs and the alienation of needs. Marx develops the general philosophical concept of need in the economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844 and in the German ideology. In the following exposition, we shall therefore, where possible, refer to these works. Some of the problems are not taken up again in the later works, at least not in a systematic manner. Others are presented in his mature writings with various modified interpretations. Where there are sufficiently clear indications of changes in Marx's thought, which appear particularly in the Grundrisse, we shall contrast them with the ideas of the young Marx. Man's need and the object of the need are correlated. The need is always related to some concrete object or to an objective activity. The objects bring about the needs and the needs bring about the objects. The need and its object are moments, sides of one in the same complex. But if we analyze not one static mode, but the dynamic of a social body, presupposing that this social body has a dynamic, then the moment of production occupies first place. It is production which creates new needs. Certainly the production that creates new needs is also correlated with the needs that are already present. The various shaping of material life is of course, in every case, dependent on the needs which are already developed. And the production, as well as the satisfaction of these needs, is a historical process. Naturally, the object of need is not restricted in its meaning, the objectivity of material things. The world in its totality is an objective world. Every social relation, every social product is the objectif objectivation of man. Later on, Marx makes a basic distinction between objectivation and objectification. However, this does not indicate any modification of the theory of need. In the process of objectification of man, the human senses come about. It is the already present objectified human condition that develops human senses and needs in every man, at least as far as possible. Thus, the objectification of the human essence, both in its theoretical and practical aspects, is required to make a man's sense human, as well as to create the human sense corresponding to the entire wealth of human and natural substance. The highest object of human need is the other person. In other words, the measure in which man has become the highest object of need for other men determines the level of humanization of human needs. Animal needs, too, are always directed towards objects. But animal needs and their objects are given by the biological constitution of the animal. They can indeed be developed, but only as regards their manner of satisfaction. As the natural limits recede, however, human needs are increasingly orientated towards objectification in the sense of activity as well as in the sense of objectivation. Man creates the objects of his need and, at the same time, the means for satisfying it. These two can correspond with each other, but not unconditionally. The history of man's origins is, at root, the history of the origins of his needs. This theory of Genesis is to be found twice in Marx's work, in two neighboring passages of the German ideology. The first historical act is thus the production of the means to satisfy these needs, i.e. animal needs, and shortly afterwards, and this production of new needs is the first historical act. Between them, these quotations express the same thought from two different points of view. Insofar as we create tools to satisfy our needs, the need for tools is already a new need, different from animal needs. The poetic expression, the first historical act, therefore describes the creation of new needs and qualities of need not given in man's biological constitution. Human need therefore comes about in the process of, ob of objectification. The objects of need guide and steer man who is born in human society in the formation of his needs. 
The needs are, in a general sense, abandoned in the course of their objectivation and in the objectified world, and the objectifying activities bring about new needs. The orientation of needs towards objects also points to the active character of needs. Needs are simultaneously passions and capacities. The passion and capacity to appropriate the object, and thus capacities are themselves needs. The capacity for objective activity is thus one of the greatest needs of man. This philosophical conception is the very foundation and subsequently the, the determining factor in Marx's conception of the development of labor into a vital need. In general, we can call need only that human need which is related to objectivation and guided by it. In the case of animals, one speaks of necessity, instinct, drive, etc. This is, of course, merely a question of definition. It is important for us only because of the decisive role it plays in the analysis of the socialized psyche, e.g. in the analysis of what, like needs, guides human instincts and drives, as well as the desires, passions, and longings which are orientated towards the individual object of needs. In the animal, it is not possible to draw this kind of distinction between attitude towards the object and the individual object of its drive. Need as demand created by the, the objectifications themselves and orientated towards qualitatively different classes of objects and the individual desire guided by these needs for concrete specimens of such objects. The former can be seen as a value relationship the latter cannot, are a complex phenomenon. In it, the specifically historical anthropological application of the concept of need appears to be not very significant. This does not only apply to those needs or desires which are perfectly free from biological motives. The sexual need directed towards a mother has for many thousands of years stood in opposition to the social norms of sexual need and to the value relation inherent in the need. Otherwise, it would not have created a complex in the psychological sense of the word. In this case, the objects of the need, and thus the needs themselves, are socially, or as a result of interiorization, individually abandoned for the biological motive which functions in a universal way, e.g. drives such as sex or hunger. Do not think that we are digressing from the analysis of Marxist thought, in fact, Marx takes the trouble on several occasions to distinguish needs from the desires directed towards concrete objects. In his investigation of the psychological relation to needs, that is, the psychological aspect of need, Marx appears essentially as a man of the Enlightenment, and his thinking is akin to Fourier's. In the German ideology, during an attack on Stirner, he writes, whether a desire becomes fixed or not depends on whether material circumstances allow of this desire being satisfied normally and, on the other hand, of the development of a whole mass of desires. This latter depends, in turn, on whether we live in circumstances that allow all-round activity and thereby the full development of all our potentialities. In a passage later crossed out in the manuscript of the same work, he examines this problem in depth. We think it right to refer to this quotation here, since Marx undoubtedly still held to the position that he expressed there. The line of argument corresponds in all essentials to what was adopted in the final drafting and is expressed in the following terms. Communist organization has a twofold effect on the desires produced in the individual by present day conditions. Some of these desires, namely those existing under all conditions, which only change their form and direction under different social conditions, are merely, merely altered by the, the communist social system, for they are given the opportunity to develop normally. Others, however, namely those originating in a particular social system, are totally deprived of their conditions of existence. So Marx speaks of desires which are fixed and irremovable those, in fact, which are based on biological motives. And he goes on to note that communists only strive to achieve an organization of production and intercourse which will make possible the normal satisfaction of all needs. 
i.e. a satisfaction which is limited only by the needs themselves. Let us note first that the expression normal plays a decisive role in all three quotations. Normality often functions and marks as a criterion of value. The introduction to a critique of political economy comes to mind, where Marx speaks of ancient Greece as the normal infancy of humanity. If man is rich in needs, and if the satisfaction of his needs is limited only by other needs, then desires are channeled along a normal course. They are not fixed exclusively on a single object and thus can be satisfied normally. Marx does not return elsewhere to the psychological aspect of needs, but on this question he clearly never gave up his rationalist enlightenment point of view. The point is not only that he assumes that in the society of associated producers, the structure of the psyche and of consciousness will be profoundly different from that of the present, but also that he never questions this possibility or the process itself. Nor does he raise the question of the tempo of this change in psyche. So long as men are changing society, they are also radically changing themselves. It is a natural, that is, normal process, whose outcome is never in doubt. To prevent misunderstanding, I would like to make it clear that I do not wish to defend the notion of eternal human nature. In communism, there is already an affirmation of the possibility that the human psyche should change radically in the process of overcoming alienation. However, on the one hand, this process is much longer and more complicated than Marx thought. And on the other, I do not think that a society and a human psyche can exist in which collision between desires and needs is impossible. The fact that only other needs place limits on the satisfactions satisfaction of needs still does not assert anything about the relation between passions and needs. The prediction that only other needs will place limits on needs may be true of the reciprocal relationship between satisfiable needs, although in this case too there might be doubts about which needs limit which others. But this view may not be universally valid because material needs are limited by production whilst other needs are limited by the most diverse and heterogeneous objects. The problem of the alienation of needs constitutes the center of Marx's philosophical analysis of needs. Here too, as we have seen, the criterion of value is, is man rich in needs. The alienation of needs is equivalent to alienation of this wealth. Man rich in needs is thus a is thus a consciously philosophical construct, and not one which is concocted from empirical facts. There never was a society in which the members of any class or stratum of people could be characterized in terms of the wealth of their needs. The individual in ancient society was only apparently such. His wealth was in fact limited. It was the wealth of a man who had not yet cut the umbilical cord of natural community. Indeed, this epoch was characterized by the emergence of man's human and theoretical senses. It is also true that even in this structure of needs, quality and not quantity predominated. In Capital, Marx often underlines, with reference sometimes to Plato and sometimes to Aristotle, the superiority of the, the, the thinkers of antiquity in this respect, as compared with the ideologues of the bourgeoisie. He observes, ironically, how the expropriation which gave birth to the tragic poets and philosophers of Greece ought to be judged differently from that which produced only textile magnates. However, the community structure that circumscribes unlimited expansion of production not only determines the limitness of the versatility of the individual, but also makes the historical period of universality of rich needs ephemeral and reversible, as in fact it was reversed in subsequent historical development. Furthermore, needs are distributed qualitatively in the division of labor of those societies based on natural community. The feudal serf had needs qualitatively different from those of the landed proprietor, not because he could not acquire the objects of his needs, but because these were qualitatively different on the basis of a given nature, in the sense of the natural character of the life of the community. Precisely for this reason, needs had to remain one-sided and limited. They could not become individual, 
and we're all subordinated to the fixed structure of the community. In general, the enjoyment of all hitherto existing estates and classes had to be either childish, exhausting, or crude because it was always completely divorced from the vital activity, the real content of the life of the individuals, and more or less reduced to imparting an illusory content to a meaningless activity. The individual rich in needs as a socially characteristic type is therefore a philosophical construct, which can only be verified in the future, but which, according to Marx, must arise in the future. Neither objective nature nor subjective nature is directly given a form adequate to the human essence. We have said that the concept of man rich in needs, according to Marx's intention, is partly a pure philosophical construct, but he, const but he constant constantly seeks to base it on empirical facts, which also contain a value emphasis. And this is precisely why he makes use of the concept of human essence. The human essence, the wealth of man, of which the conceptual cons constituents are universality, consciousness, social existence, objective existence, and freedom, achieved its characteristic of dynamis when man raised himself to the level of mankind. What differentiates man as a social being from the animal world are the possibilities of the species in itself. In the course of its process of development, humanity can only realize the possibilities that accord with its given nature as a species. In class societies, this latter quality develops through oppositions. It is on the social plane as a whole that men develop their given qualities in accordance with the species, at least up to a certain point. But human beings as individuals do not participate in the wealth of the social whole. Whilst the individual subordinated to the division of labor remains poor in the broadest sense of the word, there is a parallel enrichment of the species, the highest level of enrichment reached so far, i.e. capitalism, is also the peak of individual impover impoverishment. The overcoming of alienation, of private property subsumed under the division of labor, makes every individual able to participate in social wealth as a whole both as regards enjoyment and as regards activity, and this assumes a new and higher form. Only then will man become a being that accords with the nature of the species for itself. Only then will internal and external nature adequately match the human essence. A form of alienation that is typical of class society is, according to Marx, religion. In it, and in its, great, in its greatest object, God, the essential forces of man appear as forces outside of himself that dominate him. Alienation, alienation of the object and of human need, is expressed in religious need. The earthly family gives us the key to the holy family. Religious alienation and need will disappear only when humanity has overcome alienation here on earth. To mere atheism, an attempt to conquer one form of alienation by substituting another for it, one should therefore counterpose communism, the movement which abolishes the discrepancy between the human species and the individual, between essence and being in general, and which thus conquers religious need as need. In Marx's interpretation, alienation, alienation is not some sort of long-standing distortion of the species, or of human nature. The essence of man develops within alienation itself, and this creates the possibility for the realization of man rich in needs. Marx's exposition becomes passionate in tone when he describes the universalizing and enriching aspects of capitalist society. Since the relevant texts are in general well known, we shall only quote a brief passage here. The development of the natural sciences to their highest point, likewise the discovery, creation, and satisfaction of new needs arising from society itself, the cultivation of all the qualities of the social human being, production of the same in a form as rich as possible in needs, because rich in qualities and relations, production of this being as the most total and universal possible social product, is likewise a condition of production founded on capital. 
However, capitalism does not only produce new social needs and capacities. By generalizing the commodity relation, it turns money into the quantitative embodiment of social wealth. Needs are no longer allocated according to their quality on the basis of the natural division of labor. No member of society is excluded in principle from the satisfaction of needs of whatever quality one simply has to purchase the objects of one's needs. At the same time, however, capitalism as a social relation limits the enrichment of needs, which is its own creation. According to Marx, it does this in two ways. It reproduces poverty, in particular for the proletariat, for whom it is poverty in the strict sense of the word, and for the bourgeoisie in the philosophical sense of the word. In the last, in la in the last analysis, it limits the development of productive forces, partly because of the law of the failing rate of profit, partly as a result of crises that necessarily re recur, and it degrades that highest productive force, the worker. Very deliberately, Marx emphasizes the fact that capitalism creates needs that are rich and many-sided at the same time as it, as it impoverishes men and makes the worker a person without needs. It is here that the theme of radical needs appears. This is, as we shall see, more or less the late motive of Marx's composition. Man rich in needs is a philosophically constructed concept, and the human essence, even though its foundations are empirical, is only, and only is not to be understood here in a derogatory sense, a value category. However, if the necessity of realizing the essence of the species and the idea of a future man rich in needs originated only in the mind of a private philosopher or private critic named Karl Marx, then who would overthrow capitalism and why? Who would not merely cause it to fall, but would also transcend it in the direction in which Marx envisaged, in spite of the fact that he always rejected the expression an, an ideal to be realized? Theory entering into the masses becomes a material force, but only if the need already exists for them to take it up. When alienation has reached its extreme level, it must produce the need to transcend it, the need for wealth and for the realization of the essence of the species. It is the greatest paradox in Marx's theory of alienation, a paradox which, we hope, can express real possibilities. Following Marx, let us now analyze the alienation of needs in capitalism. We can subdivide the extraordinarily complex set of references into four groups of problems, which we shall examine in turn. The means and relation, quality and quantity, impoverishment or reduction, interests. In alienated development, that is in the alienated condition of wealth, Every end becomes a means, and every means an end. This inversion of means and ends is expressed in every aspect of the human essence. As we have already emphasized under normal, that is, human conditions, the main end of man is other man. Alienation changes this main end into means, and man becomes, for other man, a mere means, a means towards the satisfaction of his own private ends, of his greed. In all societies, labor possesses a dual character. It is abstract labor and concrete labor. The end of concrete labor is to satisfy human needs. The performance of this labor, i.e. work, is itself the means. In alienation, and particularly in capitalism, the end-means relation inherent in labor is turned upside down and becomes its opposite. In commodity-producing society, use value, the product of concrete labor, does not serve to satisfy needs. Its essence consists, on the contrary, in satisfying the needs of the person to whom it does not belong. The nature of the use value that the worker produces is all the same to him. He bears no relation to it. It is abstract labor which he performs to satisfy his own needs. It is for this reason and this reason alone that he works to maintain himself to satisfy his bare, ne his bare necessary needs. 
The process reaches its culmination when, with the machine, the performance of labor becomes mere means. Machine labor preys on the nervous system to an extreme degree. It suppresses the many-sided action of the muscles and takes away all free physical and mental activity. Work itself becomes a means of torture so that the machine does not free the worker from labor but takes away from him the content of his own labor. The development of productive forces in a purely social society has the normal end of lightening the toil of the worker freeing him from brutal and inhuman forms of labor, of reducing labor time and producing greater wealth for everyone. However, even here the means and relation is turned upside down. Since in capitalism the production of surplus value is the goal of increased productivity, this latter too becomes a mere means. So the toil of the worker is not lightened, but is rendered more inhumane. Working time does not diminish. It increases, and in parallel with the production of wealth, poverty is produced and reproduced, in the literal sense as well as in the philosophical sense. According to Marx, the end of social production ought to be the satisfaction of social needs. But capitalist industry and agriculture do not produce for needs, nor for their satisfaction. The end of production is the valorization of capital, and the satisfaction of needs on the market is only a means towards this end. We witness an inversion of the ends-means relationship in social and community relations too. In normal conditions, the community fulfills an end function. We shall refer to this later on. Togetherness and communal, and communal enjoyment are among the highest forms of needs and of satisfaction of need. Communal activity and communal, communal enjoyment, i.e. activity and enjoyment which are directly expressed and confirmed in real association, real association with other men, will occur wherever such a direct expression of sociability is based on the essence of its content and is adequate to its nature. When alienation assumes its extreme form in capitalism, Authentic community disappears because the commodity relation becomes the sole pseudo-community. Social ends and content and social togetherness becomes means to the private or become means to the private ends of private persons. Only in civil society do the various forms of social connectedness confront the individual as a mere means towards his private purposes as external necessity. Marx is of the opinion that the communist movement as a movement is able to introduce normality into the end means relationship in this respect. The aim of meetings of communist workers is originally propaganda, but at the same time, as a result of this association, they acquire a new need, the need for society. And what appeared as a means now becomes an end. The need for communal existence, the need for community, becomes the need for an end instead of for a means. In the faces of these workers is reflected the nobility of man. Last but not least, the very wealth of needs is converted from an end into a means. Every person speculates on creating a new need in another. Each tries to establish over the other an alien power so as thereby to find satisfaction of his own selfish need. Capitalism is the pimp that by constantly producing new objects creates an unending stream of new needs which make people prostitute themselves. The numerical growth of needs will never be able to become true wealth because it is merely a means serving an alienated force, alien to individual human beings, i.e. the expansion of capitalist production. The extension of products and needs becomes the ingenious and calculating slave of inhuman, artificial, and imaginary cravings. In our present examination of the problem, we shall certainly take into consideration the imaginary and ingenious nature of the cravings. All the same, imaginary needs do not exist. Whether needs are normal or whether they are artificial, using the word negatively, depends completely upon the value judgments with which we define normality. However, even if we sought so-called objective criterion, we would only be able to conclude that, at any time, 
Normal needs are those which individuals deem to be such. Sophisticated or unnatural needs, on the other hand, are those which the majority regards as such. The concept of artificial needs is ambiguous even in Marx. Sometimes he means so-called luxury needs, which, as has already been pointed out, can only be defined as such in economic terms. In philosophical terms, they constitute an irrelevant group of needs. Elsewhere, they signify the accumulation of a specific type of needs, characterized by the fact that the attempt to satisfy them does not guarantee, and indeed may hinder, the development of a qualitatively many-sided rich world of needs. If now, in the course of analyzing his conception as a whole, we interpret artificial or calculated needs in this latter sense, it is not going too far to say that Marx actually discovered the problem of manipulated needs, and indeed of the, of the manipulation of needs. A given need does not become a manipulated need because of its concrete quality, but for the following reasons. A. Constantly new objects of needs and hence constantly new needs appear at that point where the production of specific commodities and of the needs corresponding to them is most profitable and or profitable from the point of view of valorizing capital. B. The true objective is therefore the satisfaction of the needs of an essentially alien force. The creation and satisfaction of individual needs, even if this appears to be or appears to the individual as an end, is in reality only a means in the hands of this essential force. C. The typical consequence of the mechanism of capitalist production is that there is an increase in needs within a group of needs of a determined type and an orientation of the individual towards their satisfaction. While other types of needs which shape the human personality, which do not help the valorization of capital and can even hinder it, wither or fail to develop to the same extent. Thus, the expansion of individual consumer goods causes the continuous introduction of new products and develops such a mass of corresponding needs that it becomes a break upon the need for free time and hindrance to its development. D. Individual freedom is therefore mere appearance. The individual chooses the objects of his needs and molds his personal needs in a way that conforms not with his personality, but with their position in the division of labor. E. From one point of view, the individual certainly becomes effectively more rich. He will have more needs and more objects of need, but this enrichment is one-sided and not limited by other needs. Since the goal is not the many-sided development of the individual, the individual person becomes the slave of this one-sided development or developed group of needs. Since Marx made his analysis, the situation has changed, but only to a certain extent. The change is significant, but not in relation to our general problem. Manipulated needs are not today peculiar only to the dominant classes, but affect the majority of the population, at least in the developed capitalist countries. Today, we can see a process of rebellion starting again, or starting against the manipulation of needs, especially in the United States. It is of the utmost importance that this process should go ahead, together with the inversion of the end means alienation in relation to the community. Needs related to the possession of goods can increase infinitely. No other need imposes limits on their growth. Since possession is detached from use and from immediate enjoyment, the role of enjoyment is taken over by possession itself. The increase in needs is quantitative in character. I cannot possess so much as not to want to possess still more. I want to have more, even when the concrete qualities of the objects in my possession do not immediately satisfy any kind of need. I become indifferent towards these concrete qualities. What I possess does not develop any new heterogeneous types of need in me, but on the contrary, mutilates them. 
The person who deals in diamonds, as Marx writes, pays no attention to the aesthetic beauty of the diamond because he sees it only as an embodiment of exchange value. True wealth is, on the contrary, the development of heterogeneous qualities in types of need. Money, the money relation, is the inversion of the normal quality-quantity relation. It is the embodiment and the bearer of the quantification of needs. Money is the purely quantitative representation of social wealth. The quantity of money becomes, to an ever greater degree, its sole effective quality. Just as it reduces everything to its abstract form, so it reduces itself in the course of its own movement to quantitative entity. Excess and intemperance come to be its true norm. The excess that arises in the money relation is described in this passage with an unambiguously negative value judgment. We have already noted that Marx's attitude towards capitalism changed between the economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844 and the Grand Race. In the Grand Race, pride of place is given to the discovery of the contradictory character of capitalism. And, for this reason, the quantification of needs is analyzed with a dual value judgment, which corresponds to the two opposed constituents of the contradiction. This fact is expressed in Marx by a very significant change in terminology. In the manuscripts, the expression abstract predominates in his description of the function of money. We may recall that money has reduced every being to its own abstraction. In the Grand Race and thereafter, this function is instead usually indicated by the expression in general. Reduct reduction to abstract form always carries in Marx a negative value judgment whilst the expression general always has a positive one. It will be remembered that the reduction of labor to abstract labor, the indifference of the worker for the specific quality of his work in relation both to the product, to his labor, and to the activity in which he engages, represents the most extreme expression of the alienation of labor, whilst labor in general, production in general, conscience, consciousness in general, industrial activity in general, produce and express wealth in general. Naturally, we are talking here merely of a shift in emphasis, not of a radical change in outlook. The idea of generality as applied to money is also to be found, though in different words, in the economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844. Money is the alienated ability of mankind and conversely, the argument that money relations produce an abstract need for enjoyment also appears in the Grand Race, but only once and as a special case. The abstract search for enjoyment realizes that function of money in which it is the material representative of wealth. The shift in emphasis is, however, beyond doubt. In the Grand Race, the quantification of needs, as opposed to the system of needs of natural communities, is represented as alienated development, and, more precisely, as an alienated but necessary form of development. Both alienation and development are given prominence in the economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844, where they appear as examples of a fictian ultimate wickedness, but the main theme is alienation and not development. In the Grand Race, the quantification of quality is the overcoming of limited, limitedness. In this work, all the themes of the economic and philosophic manuscripts appear, but they are orchestrated differently. The quantification of quality is a form of alienation which, in a given historical context, prepares the conditions for the creation of general wealth. There is no other way of attaining such a stage in social development. This kind of ingenuity in producing the objects of needs, including those of new ones, the increase of needs of one specific type, is represented as development and as the necessary condition for such development, and this too relates only to one specific historical period. When the aim of labor is not a particular product standing in a particular relation to the particular needs of the individual, but money, wealth in its general form, 
Then, firstly, the individual's industriousness knows no bounds. It is indifferent to its particularity and takes on every form which serves the purpose. It is ingenious in the creation of new objects for social need, etc. General industri industriousness is possible only where every act of labor produces general wealth, not a particular form of it. However, here too Marx judges capitalism as a society that imposes quantitative limits on quality and in two different relationships. The transformation into money, exchange value as such, as limit of production, is equivalent to restriction of the production of use values by exchange value, or that real wealth has to take on a specific form distinct from itself, a form not absolutely identical with it, in order to become an object of production at all. Let us state explicitly the two relationships mentioned. One, value relations limit new objects of need and the creation of new needs within a group of needs. Here we see as part of the problematic of need the, con the conception that in capitalist society productivity increases. New use values grow in number and in quality only so long as surplus value increases. Marx puts forward from time to time the hypothesis of a point in capitalist production at which the production of new objects of needs and of new needs ceases. The contradiction between the relations of production and the productive forces. We have drawn attention to the fact that, at least until now, Marx's prediction has not been confirmed. The quantification of needs does not, in this sense, reduce the quality, but the last passage quoted asserts something else and goes further. 2. Use values that do not represent exchange value cease to be objects of production. Capitalism quantifies all its objective expressions and produces them, as it also produces the needs directed towards them, only if it is profitable to do so. In this sense, Marx often speaks, for example, about the fact that capitalism is hostile to art. Capitalism produces objects of art which are, first and foremost, bearers of exchange value, which yield profit. As far as the average of, of society is concerned, the needs for high art are stunted in favor of those for a cheap art which is reproduced to an ever greater extent. Capitalism at the same time quantifies the complexly qualitative world of human needs, turns it into quasi-exchange value, and renders it purchasable. All qualitative needs that can either can neither be quantified nor purchased are inhibited. This is precisely the reason why in Marx's analysis of money, of pure quantity, in the Grand Reis there appears an apocalyptic world. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast and that no man might buy or sell, save that he hath the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. However, money can not only restrict quality, quantify qualitative needs, and cause those which are not quantifiable to atrophy. It can also quantify the non-quantifiable and transform qualitative needs into their opposite. That which is for me through the medium of money that for which I can pay, i.e. which money can buy, that am I, the possessor of the money. The extent of the power of money is the extent of my power. Money's properties are my properties and essential powers, the properties and powers of its possessor. Thus, what I am and am capable of is by no means determined by my individuality. Do not I, who thinks to money am capable of all that the human heart longs for, possess all human capacities? Does not my money, therefore, transform all my incapacities into their contrary? In the society of the future, in the society that conforms to the species as it really is, the essence of the species will no longer be alienated from man, and so will not be able to assume a quantitative form. Human needs and capacities will be of a qualitative nature. The qualitative can be exchanged only with the qualitative, and that means exclusively with quality of the same kind. This argument is developed only in the economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844. 
the needs of man will then stand in a direct and qualitative relation to the objects of those needs. This is the meaning of the positive overcoming of private property and the realization of the world of individual property. Individual property means the direct relation between qualitative needs. Assume man to be man and his relationship to the world to be a human one. Then you can exchange love only for love, trust for trust, etc. To enjoy art, you must be an artistically cultivated person. To exercise influence over other people, you must be a person with a stimulating and encouraging effect on other people. Every one of your relations to man and to nature must be a specific expression corresponding to the object of your will, of your real individual life. Let us repeat once more. In the Grand Reis, all the themes of the economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844 re-emerge, but the value judgment is somewhat different. The quantification of the unquantifiable is no less oppressive in the one than in the other. However, by comparison with the economic and philosophic manuscripts, the Grand Reis underlines the alienated development that is expressed in the quantification of qualitatively restricted needs. If money is the general equivalent, if it is purchasing power in general, then everything can be bought, everything can be transformed into money. But it can be transformed into money only insofar as it is alienated. So-called inalienable eternal possessions thus crumble when money buys them. Everything, in, everything can be had for ready cash. So just as everything can be alienated for money, so everything can also, have a, however, be bought for money. Therefore, everything can be appropriated by everyone, and it depends on circumstances what an individual does or does not appropriate for himself, and that in turn depends on the money that is in his possession. With it, the individual is in himself lord of all things. There is nothing higher, nothing sacred, etc., from the moment when everything can be possessed by means of money. The alienation of the essence of the species and the quantification of all the qualities are necessary so that pure qualitative need may come about, even if only as a possibility. Pure qualitative need meaning not the need assigned by the natural division of labor, but downright individual need. The most significant form of expression of the impoverishment of needs and of capacities is the reduction in homogenization of needs. Both are characteristic of the dominant classes as much as of the working class, but not in the same way. The need to have is that to which all needs are reduced and which makes them homogeneous. For the dominant classes, this having is effective possession. It is a need directed towards private property and money in ever increasing quantity. The worker's need to have relates instead to mere survival. He lives in order to be able to maintain himself. All these physical and mental senses have therefore the sheer estrangement of all these senses, the sense of having. Or again, all passions and all activity must therefore be submerged in greed. The worker may only have enough for him to want to live and may only want to live in order to have that. Marx summarizes the reduction and homogenization of needs in capitalism as follows. The less you are, the more you have. In stating that the worker is a being without needs, Marx is alluding to this reduction. The worker must be deprived of every need in order to be able to satisfy one need only, that is, the need to keep himself alive. And you must not only stint the immediate gratification of your senses, as by stinting yourself on food, etc. You must also spare yourself at sharing of general interest, all sympathy, all trust, etc. There is only one thing which the worker must not be deprived of, his labor power. However, the application of labor power, labor in capitalist conditions, is itself a process of reduction. The actual carrying out of work does not represent a need as far as the worker is concerned. As a result of the division of labor, the main force of production, the main force of production being the human being himself, is restricted. This concludes the question of the reduction and homogenization of needs. Or does it? 
we have already quoted one of the most important paradoxes in Marx's theory, and we shall return to it. On the one hand, capitalist society reduces to mere having and homogenizes into greed the system of needs, both of the dominant class and of the working class, though in different ways. On the other hand, it generates antagonistic radical needs which transcend capitalist society and whose bearers are called upon to overthrow capitalism. According to Marx's formulation in the manuscripts, the human being had to be reduced to this absolute poverty in order that he might yield his inner wealth to the outer world. Interest is not for Marx a philosophical social category of a general character. Interest as a motive of individual action is nothing but the expression of the reduction of needs to greed. In the philosophical generalization of the concept of interest, it is the standpoint of bourgeois society that is reflected. The organic moment and the essential feature of the overcoming of alienation is precisely the disappearance of interest as a motive. Already in the economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844, one can read that need, that need or enjoyment have consequently lost their egotistical nature, and nature has lost its mere utility by becoming human use. However, one observation is necessary here. In contrast to the marks of the manuscripts, the mature marks sharply distinguishes the category of utility from that of interest. In the Communist Manifesto, it is not utility itself, but the reduction to a usefulness, rela usefulness relation that is equated with the interest relation. Let us remind ourselves how Marx describes and explains the concept of use value, together with that of utility. From the Grand Ries to Capital, and finally in the marginal notes to the Manual of Political Economy by Adolf Wagner, the concept of utility always appears with a positive value judgment. In the mature works, utility and usefulness are either simply the qualities of goods when he is employing the naturalistic conception, or they are categories for the orientation of value towards the objects of human activity and enjoyment when he is employing the non-naturalistic conception. It is only this distinction made in the mature works that is relevant to our problem here. We cannot go deeply into such an analysis here, but let us look direct or let us look briefly at how the concept of utility has developed in the course of the history of philosophy. I have given a deeper analysis of the useful harmful pairing of secondary categories of the orientation of value in my Hypotheses zu einer Marxistischen <laughs> or Theory. <laughs> For the ancients, the concept of usefulness played a primary role. E.g. Aristotle, that is good which is useful for man. It continues to be important in medieval thought. Neither ancient nor medieval philosophy knew the category of interest. In my book on Aristotle, I wrongly attributed this to the restrictedness of ancient society. It is only bourgeois philosophy that has attributed central importance to the categories of interest, individual interest and general interest, an importance that has become proportionately greater as bourgeois society itself has developed. The theory of interest finds its fullest expression in the French Enlightenment and in Hegel. The theory of utility in bourgeois philosophy is in truth a theory of interest. The categories of utility and of interest become synonymous. The critics of capitalism could not get rid of it simply by setting a citizen theory of value against the bourgeois theory. Marx shows his outstanding genius when, with a single move, he dispenses not only with the solution, but with the whole formulation of the problem. In reply to a letter from Engels arguing that there was a rational kernel in Stirner's theory of egoism, Marx expresses in a way that leaves no room for doubt his rejection of such a position, a rejection that we find not only in his critique of Stirner, but later on in the Grand Ries. We may note that this difference between the conceptions of Marx and Engels reappears in the subsequent fate of this category. Engels found it sufficient to substitute for the category of the individual interest the general category of the class interest. Marx, as we shall see, went much further. 
as well as rejecting the general ontological use of the concept of interest. Mark also re Marx also rejected both the so-called individual interest and the general or complexly social categories of interest and all categories used in an analogous way. If at times in the German ideology and even in the Grundrisse, the controversy is still open, later on Marx expresses his rejection by the fact that he only rarely uses this category. In particular, it is necessary to note that he only very rarely uses the category of class interest. One may search in vain for the concept of class interest in works such as the Grand Reis, Capital, Wages, Prices and Profit, or Theories of Surplus Value. It does not appear once, not even with reference to the class struggle. The reason for this is not that class interest does not exist for Marx, but because in his view, one was dealing with something that could only be interpreted within the framework of the fetishized reality of capitalism. Or, better still, one might say that this concept itself has a fetishistic character. So the class interest cannot be the motive of a class struggle that goes beyond capitalist society. The true motive, free from fetishism, is represented by the radical needs of the working class. It was Engels in anti During who pointed to class interest as one of the factors determining the class struggle. To be precise, however, we ought to note that for Engels, it was not one of those exclusive and unequivocal terms which come into common use in later Marxist analysis, from the time of the Second International, particularly in Kotsky. In Marx, the duality between individual interests and general or class interests is nothing but the expression of the fact that, from the point of view of motivation, man in bourgeois society is split into bourgeois and citizen. The individual interest is the openly recognized motive of the bourgeois, while it is the general interest which motivates the citizen. Both are alienated motivations, but in the latter there is a double alienation, since here the individual interest is alienated also, alienated also from the individual himself. Let us now consider the most important passage in which these categories are dealt with. In the Holy Family, dealing with the Declaration of the Rights of Man, Marx writes as follows. As the state of old had slavery as its natural basis, the modern state has civil society in the man of civil society, i.e. the independent man depending on other men only by private interest and unconscious natural necessity. The slave of earning his living and of his own as well as other men's selfish need. The modern state has recognized this as its natural basis in the universal rights of man. In this quotation, an idea from the economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844 reappears, this time with a specific reference. Private interest is simply the so-called greed that is a consequence of the reduction of needs. It is no accident that expressions such as natural necessity, the natural basis, or slave play such a decisive role. They are not mere relics of a sort of Fauerbachism. The question, in all its interconnections, is and remains central to the thought of Marx. Civil society, the first pure society, functions in fact in its pure social relations as quasi-nature, because in it necessity reigns in the form of economic chains. Man, having become the slave of his own private interests, of his own egoism, and of others, is a quasi-natural being because his egoism is of a compulsive character and functions as a quasi-instinct. Man must follow its dictates or end in ruin. Therefore, it is natural necessity, essential human properties, however alienated they may seem to be, and interests that hold the members of civil society together. Civil, not political life, is their real tie. In the German ideology, in the attack on Stirner, Marx gives a highly coherent treatment of the double alienation of the general interest and of the class interest. Let us quote the most important passages in full. How is it that personal interests always develop against the will of individuals into class interests, into common interests which acquire an independent existence in relation to the individual persons? 
and in this independent existence assume the form of general interests? How is it that as such they come into contradiction with actual individuals, and in this contradiction, by which they are defined as general interests, they can be conceived by consciousness as ideal, and even as religious, holy interests? How is it that in this process of private interests acquiring independent existence as class interests, the personal behavior of the individual is bound to be rendered banal, to be alienated, and at the same time exists as a power independent of him, and without him created by intercourse, and becomes transformed into social relations, into a series of powers which determine and subordinate the individual, and which therefore appear in the imagination as holy powers. If Senko had only understood the fact that within the framework of certain modes of production, which are of course independent of the will, there are alien practical forces above men, which are independent not only of isolated indiv individuals, but also of their totality. Stirner would not then have arrived at the absurdity, worthy of him, of explaining the division between personal and general interests, by saying that people represent this division to themselves in a religious way, too, and that they match each other in this or that way, which is, however, only another word for representation. The principal observations that we can dig out from this and other passages are as follows. A. The general interest and the class interest do not exist only as man's representations, as an ideal pole opposed to their own personal interests. There are categories of social structures governed by social forces that are independent of men and assert themselves against the will of the individual. The existence of general interests, therefore, mirrors the fetishization of social relations. This process culminates in a society that is purely a producer of commodities, that is, in capitalism. B. The personal interest and the general or class interest are, cor are correlated. C. Whatever interest is chosen, be it theoretical or practical, one remains within the commodity-producing capitalist society. That is, its fetishistic character is accepted. Communists do not put egoism against self-sacrifice or self-sacrificed against egoism. Communist theoreticians, the only ones who have time to devote to the study of history, are distinguished precisely because they alone have discovered that throughout history, the general interest is created by individuals who are defined as private persons. They know that this contradiction is only a seeming one because one side of it, the so-called general, is constantly being produced by the other side, private interest, and by no means opposes the latter as an independent force with an independent history, so that this contradiction is in practice always being destroyed and reproduced. This quotation bears witness to the fact that communists do not refer to any kind of general interest, not even to class interest. They cannot consider it a motive for a class struggle transcending capitalism because to refer to it means, by that very fact, to remain within the capitalist world. Reference to working class interests is therefore possible only in class struggle that does not transcend capitalism. Then, in fact, it is realistic because it invokes a category of being, the fetishistic correlation of personal interests. One should not therefore be surprised that at the time of the Second International, the reference to class interest, in no way corresponding to the spirit of Marx, should have been so widespread. Every movement that is limited to a program adequate to the egoistic, egoistical interests of the individual worker Above all, the struggle for wages, which opens up for each worker the prospect of a greater material wealth in the narrow sense, realistically and with reason invokes the class interest. It is questionable whether Marx changed this position in his later works or not. As we have indicated in his scientific work, works reference is only rarely made to the category of the general and common interest, or to the concept of the class interest. We shall look at the passages in question and analyze their meaning. In the Grand Race and the Analysis of Commodity Exchange, he says, The reciprocity in which each is at the same time means an end and attains his end only insofar as he becomes a means 
and becomes a means only insofar as he posits himself as end, that each thus posits himself as being for another, insofar as he is being for self, and the other is being for him, insofar as he is being for himself. That this reciprocity is a necessary fact presupposed as natural precondition of exchange, but that, as such, it is irrelevant to each of the two subjects in exchange, and that this reciprocity interests him only in so far as it satisfies his interest, to the exclusion of it, without reference to that of the other. That is, the common interest which appears as the motive of the, of the act as a whole is recognized as a fact by both sides. But, as such, it is not the motive, but rather proceeds, as it were, behind the back of these self-reflected particular interests, behind the back of one individual's interest in opposition to that of the other. The reasoning demonstrates that the various forms of alienation of needs are only different aspects of an identical process, although they are here treated separately for the purpose of greater clarity. In this passage, Mark, Marx treats the alienation of interests the interest relation as a form of end means alienation. Marx concludes, the general interest is precisely the generality of self-seeking interests. If there is a difference between the arguments in the German ideology and this passage from the Grand Ries, it does not relate to the essence of the problem discussed here. It consists rather in the broader scope with which the problem is raised in the German ideology. There, it is a question of the different forms of the general interest, and of the forms in which the general interest can serve as the motive, albeit an alienated one. It is this, for example, that motivates man as citizen. This work deals not only with economic interests as general interests, but also with generalized interests of every kind, political interests, state interests, and so forth. Since it is commodity exchange that is being discussed in the passages from the Grand Ries, the analysis of the general interest must obviously be restricted there to economic interest. But from our point of view, such a distinction is irrelevant. In the Grand Ries, too, the general interest is represented as doubly alienated interest. The world of commodity exchange is the world of the universality of egoism, that of personal interest. The subjects of exchange are indifferent to each other. They stand in relation to each other only for the realization of their personal interests, as regards the need for other people, which, as we know, Marx considered to be the highest and most human need. The reduction is total. General interests assert themselves behind the backs of men who have already been reduced to selfishness. In this sense, therefore, the general interest is simply the restriction of one human being's interests by those of another, a structure that Hegel in his Phenomenology of Mind defines as the animal realm of the spirit. In this sense, the general interest is an alienated power resulting from the struggle between private interests and thwarting the ends and aims of gross the aims of individual human beings. Referring to this in the German ideology, Marx describes it as the determining power of all the alienated general interests, and therefore as the key to those interests that motivate human beings. We come now to the crucial concept of the class interest. In Wage, Labor, and Capital, there are two passages which Marx himself underlines. To say that the interests of capital and those of the workers are one and the same is only to say that capital and wage labor are two sides of one and the same relationship. The one determines the other, as usurer and squanderer reciprocally condition the existence of each other. And later on, we see, therefore, that even if we remain with the relationship of capital and wage labor, the interests of capital and the interests of wage labor are diametrically opposed. Here the problem is raised chiefly from the point of view of this struggle for wages, a form of class struggle that can be interpreted only within capitalist society. Even if we remain within the relationship of capital and wage labor is therefore a superfluous qualification because according to Marx, the struggle for wages is only conceivable within the relationship between wage labor and capital. The relations on the basis of such, the relations on the basis of which the struggle between wage labor and capital takes place 
or fetishistic relations within which the use of the category interests, which as we know is an objective category, can be interpreted in a completely rational way in accordance with the concept of class interests in the German ideology. It should be added that the concept can be rationally interpreted only in this sense. Furthermore, Marx did not speak of the interests of the working class, but of the interests of wage labor, of interests that derive from the reality of exploitation and moreover from the reality of a specific form of exploitation. In such a context, the working class is reduced to its immediate relationship with capital, in which capital and wage labor are two sides of one and the same relationship. It is therefore a reciprocal determination. Here he is not talking about a working class which transcends capitalism, nor could he, and still less is he talking about the radical needs which cannot be reduced to interests. Not once is this very restricted interpretation of the concept of interest to be found in Wages, Prices, and Profit, a much later work in which partly analogous problems are dealt with. This is no accident. At the center of Marx's analysis in this work stands a critique of the reduction of the trade union struggle to a struggle for wages. The difference is not quantitative in nature, but qualitative. The wages struggle, the wages struggle which, as we have seen, remains within capitalism, within the system of interests, is qualitatively different from the struggle to overcome the wages system as a whole, which is the historical mission of the working class, motivated not by interests, but by the radical needs. Trades, trades unions work well as centers of resistance against the encroachments of capital. They fail generally from limiting themselves to a guerrilla war against the effects of the existing system. Instead of simultaneously trying to change it, instead of using their organized forces as a lever for the final emancipation of the working class, that is to say the ultimate abolition of the wages system.